Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Florence Arts and Museum Speaker Series. Today, our presentation is going to be on historic preservation in Alabama. The Florence Arts and Museum Speaker Series is a monthly program meant to inspire conversations about the history and culture of North Alabama with a focus on how the past shapes the present. This presentation will focus on the various preservation programs that the Alabama Historical Commission facilitates through the state. Today, our, our presenter is Hannah Garman. Hannah is from the small town of Cordova, Alabama. She attended the University of North Alabama, where she earned a bachelor's degree in history with a minor in political science. She also earned her master's degree in May 2015 in history with a concentration of public history from UNA. She currently works at the Alabama Historical Commission as the state tax incentives and survey coordinator. Her interests include Gothic revival architecture in Alabama, civil rights history, and anything true crime related. She lives in Montgomery with her husband, son, and two dogs. Hannah, thank you very much for being here, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to you and uh, rejoin a little bit later on uh, with some questions. So thanks, thanks for being here. <clears throat> thanks. And I will say roar lines. Um, so I lived in Florence um, for about five years and I loved it and I still love it. And all the people in the shoals are just special people to me. So thanks for having me. <clears throat> so I'm going to just talk a little bit about kind of what we do. We are the Alabama Historical Commission and we're the State Historic Preservation Office. Each state in the nation has one, um, including Hawaii and Alaska. So we all have, oh, and then uh, I believe Guam and Puerto Rico also have preservation offices as well. So <clears throat> we came about because of the 1966 National Preservation Act, which was enacted by Congress to save um, America's cultural resources, which were being um, kind of destroyed left and right due to um, Eisenhower's interstate system that started uh, running in the 50s and 60s. So this was um, a kind of backlash from that to protect your cultural resources, um, whether that be the built environment, natural resources, or um, you know, archaeological resources. <clears throat> so we're the state agency charged with safeguarding Alabama's historic places, whether that be, like I said, archaeological resources or the built environment. We have a commission that consists of 21 members from all over the state of Alabama, um, including uh, representatives from the Black Heritage Council and other state organizations. We currently have around 60 staff members who, um, who do kind of what I do, who do archaeology, who run historic sites, who do you know, accounting and all of that other fun stuff that, you know, that is required to run an agency. So um, we also enforce several federal mandates, which is to assist in what is called environmental review or section 106. So that is came out of that 1966 Preservation Act um, as well. So any project that uses federal funding um, has to be reviewed to make sure if that cultural resource is um, going to be affected, if that's an adverse effect, that that effect is mitigated. A lot of times that can be through um, a survey, um, listing to either the state or national register, it could be a historical marker. We really try to um, look at the area, what could be used and what could be needed and involve the community in that uh, dialogue. So like I said, we also administer several other federal programs. One, the National Register of Historic Places, um, which we'll talk about later architectural survey program, which keeps up with uh, surveys that were done either on a countywide level or a city level. We also administer the federal um, historic tax credit program and the certified local government program. So um, what we do is we try to offer technical assistance to those who are looking for preservation information. So if you had a log cabin, on your property somewhere and you wanted to know the best way to preserve that, we can offer technical advice. We also try to educate the public about these programs that I'm gonna talk about today, as well as other preservation issues across the state. We also house our state office of archeology span and we have a state archeologist, Stacy Hathorne and an assistant state archeologist, Eric Sops, who can assist with um, burial ground questions. They can also assist with archeological questions and they oversee um, the section 106 comp archeological component. 
We also manage two state register programs, which is the Alabama Register of Landmarks and Heritage and the Cemetery Register. Um, I have worn several different hats at the commission. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do here. Um, I uh, have worked, I'm going on my seventh year. So previously I was the Cemetery Program Coordinator, Alabama Register of Landmarks and Heritage Coordinator and the Historical Marker Coordinator. My job has now shifted to being the Historic Tax Incentives Coordinator. So I do have um, some working knowledge of all of these programs, which comes in handy, believe me. So I now administer the uh, State Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit. So we also own 13 historic sites across the state of Alabama, and you'll see two in your area, which is Belmont Mansion, as well as Pond Spring, the General Joe Wheeler home. So if you haven't visited those, please, please do. They're great. Um, also, we own all of these other sites across the state of Alabama. So chances are you've probably visited one. Um, some of my favorites are um, the one you can't get out to because it's in the middle of uh, Mobile Bay, which is Middle Bay Lighthouse. It's listed to the National Register and it'll be found on our historic preservation map if you're interested in some of uh, finding more information. So I'm gonna just briefly kind of touch on each preservation program that we have. Like I said, I used to administer the Alabama Register of Landmarks and Heritage, and it's just our state register. So it's really the easiest and fastest way to get historic designation for your property. Anything can be kind of listed to the Alabama Register, which includes the built environment. So buildings, historic districts, sites, structures, which include like bridges, objects which include like monuments like the boll weevil monument and alabama is listed to the alabama register um, we have a a couple of trains we have a tram so you know it doesn't just have to be um, a building the property has to be or the site or the object at least has to be 40 years of age to qualify so right now we can list things that were constructed in 1982 that makes me feel so old um, so my husband was born in 1981, so he could technically be listed to the Alabama register. So that's a fun thing. I can't wait till we get to Butler buildings and, um, uh, mobile homes. Um, so, um, the Alabama, the next program we have is the cemetery program and all more information can be found on these on our website. We have really helpful forms and instructions to kind of walk you through these processes. But these programs like the Alabama Register and the Cemetery Program, they're for you. They're for the novice preservationist, the one who's interested in documenting your community history, your family history, your church history. These programs are for you. Um, the Cemetery Program hopes to bring awareness um, to Alabama's significant historic cemeteries. So there's about 10,000 known cemeteries in Alabama. We have about 900 listed on our cemetery register, so a very small amount. So given that fact, probably your family cemetery isn't listed to the register, and that's a great way to document your local history. So like I said, we encourage the document, documentation of cemeteries through our register. It's just like the Alabama register. It just has to be 40 years of age to qualify to be listed. It just has to have a community uh, tie, a tie to a church, a tie to a family. You can really list any cemetery um, as long as it's 40 years of age. We also try to educate the public about proper uh, cleaning techniques for preserving cemeteries, um, what, what to use, what not to use. I'll go ahead and mention D2, which is a great biological cleaner for um, headstones. So you don't wanna be using things like bleach or chalk or anything like that on your headstone because it can really damage it more than it can make it look nice and pretty. We also um, have a historical marker and plaque program. Um, so I'm gonna touch on that a little bit later as well. So um, another thing I mentioned was our certified local government program, which is a town or a city that has kind of made a commitment with the National Park Service to become a certified local government. They have to establish a historic preservation commission, but being a certified local government does not require you to have design review of historic districts. They just kind of help you can guide preservation efforts in your city if that's something that you're interested in doing. You do not have to do design review. 
So there's also the federal rehabilitation tax credit. Um, it's a little different from our state credit. The federal credit is a 20% credit and the building must be listed to the National Register of Historic Places. It doesn't have to be to start with, but it eventually does have to be listed. It's only for income producing properties, but that does include rental residential. It has to be substantially re uh, rehabilitated, so it can't just be for like a new HVAC. It needs to be a substantial rehabilitation, so including like you know, a roof or windows and, and things like that. Those are all what we consider qualified rehab expenditures. With these federal credits and the state credit, you do have to follow what is called the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. So that's just saying like, if you have to replace something like windows, you're gonna replace them in kind, like with wood windows. You can't replace like wood windows with vinyl. You can't replace wood siding with vinyl. It's all about keeping the integrity of that historic site there. So it's really key to follow those um, rehabilitation guidelines. Um, and if you're considering a project, keep that in mind, that it does place restrictions on what you can do because you're receiving a, fe a federal or a state tax incentive stating that you rehabilitated a structure in a historic manner. So those are things to keep in mind. The tax credits aren't for everyone because your project may you know, require um, things that aren't covered under the tax credit. But if you're interested in that, um, I can put you in touch with the federal coordinator. And like I said, I'm the state coordinator. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now. It is a 25% um, income um, tax credit on your state income tax liability. And unlike the federal, this tax credit is refundable. So if your state income tax liability was less than your credit, you would receive that amount back as a refund from the state of Alabama. So say your project was a $100,000 project, it just flipped on me, was a $100,000 project, your tax credit based upon that would be $25,000. If you had no state income tax liability, that $25,000 comes back to you as a refund. So it can be beneficial to not just commercial property owners, but as well as residential. I will preface as saying this, the residential credit ends in December of this year. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna take a little trip. Sorry. Um, ends at the end of this year. Um, the legislation um, was passed in May of last year, which removes uh, residential properties from being an eligible project to apply. We have very few residential projects in, in the program. Out of the 106 projects we have, only 12 are residential projects. So this isn't a huge change. Most of the projects we see are um, both federal as well as state, and they're usually income producing. So there's also another um, tax incentive that a lot of people doesn't know about, and this is for commercial properties. So if you have a commercial property that's listed in or eligible for the National Register, you can apply to get the ad valorem benefit. So what that does is it assesses your, um, your property tax at a lower level. So it assesses it then at the 10% homeowners level instead of the 20, 30, or 40% level, depending on what your building was coded as. So there is a tax incentive, like I said, that's only for commercial properties because private homes are already assessed at that lowest level. Um, it's a really simple application process. You submit it to me, I review it, and usually issue a, you a letter as long, specifically if you're, or particularly if you're in a district that's already been listed, it, it can be really a simple process. You don't have to rehab your building. This is just a reduction you get for owning a historic building. So I talked a little bit earlier about um, our historical marker program. It is open to any and everyone. Um, we used to have a restriction that the site had to be listed, but that restriction has now been removed. So anyone can get a historic marker through our, uh, through our agency, um, no matter if the, the site um, is listed or not. And we have three different kind of seals. We have our AHC seal, um, which is our state seal. We also have the Black Heritage Council seal, which is for African American um, heritage projects if they wish to do that. And if you're listed on the cemetery, 
register and want to do a cemetery sale, we have that as well. Markers can range anywhere from around $1,700 up to around $2,900, just depending upon the size, the amount of text and everything you want put on there. We have done photographs, we've done QR codes. So, you know, your historical marker can really be what you want it to be. It's a simple application process. Um, like I said, I used to be the historical marker um, coordinator, but now that um, lies, that job lies with somebody else. Leanne Waller Truth is her name, um, and you can find her information on our website. But like I said, it's a pretty simple application process. You give us the text that you want um, to have on your marker. We go back in and edit it, and we will work with you on that process. It's no um, money exchanges through our hands. This is just a service that we help facilitate. So any payment goes directly to the marker company. And at this time, we don't have funds for grants. If, if we did, I could give out millions and millions of dollars each year in grant funding for historical markers across the state. Um, people love historical markers. Um, here's an image of each seal. Um, so the AHC seal is the one you see there on the left. The cemetery seal is the one at the bottom in the middle, um, and then the Black Heritage Council seal is on the right. The seals go in the top, here I'll show you, of the marker. So you'll see these are both Alabama, uh, Alabama Historical Commission seals in front of a couple of different places, but they all are pretty standard and look like this. The small marker is the one that you see on the left. Um, it's that smaller size and our larger marker is the one you see on the right. Our large size marker with the same text on each side is probably our most popular marker. Um, and I just, I think they look really nice. So one of the other programs that we kind of um, help facilitate with the Alabama Trust for Historic Preservation is Places in Peril. Um, so Places in Peril highlights significant endangered properties all across the state of Alabama. Usually um, the application period is from May to October. That's what it was last year. We usually announce in May for Preservation Month. And then um, last year, applications closed October the 1st. Um, this really is for properties that are facing any kind of endangerment. Should it be from threat of um, like a natural disaster, um, demolition by neglect, so property owners just, you know, letting buildings fall down. Um, it could be, you know, you had a roof ripped off in a storm. There's, it could be any vandalism is another reason. So lots of different reasons you could list a property to places in peril. <clears throat> like I said, it's an application process. We then review the application, ask if there's any, um, if we need anything else, we'll let you know. And then we meet with the trust to, um, to review the properties and come up with that list. So, so places in peril, like I said, we um, meet with the Alabama Trust each year to review those applications. Last year, there were eight places. We had a, um, a lot of schools this last year, um, several different schools that are now bought owned by towns or cities that are trying to become, um, have new life that they've closed and they've become community centers or hopeful to become community centers. So um, we see a lot of different types of projects each year for places in peril. Um, another one of our programs that we get asked the most about is grants and grant funding. Um, so we try to um, try to assist as much as we can with grants. We have a grants resources page on our website that's not just for our grant program, but there's other information on there, um, like the, uh, the National Trust has grants available. There's um, sometimes disaster preparedness grants available. Um, the, um, like I said, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, they have their Sacred Places Fund for um, churches. So there are some options out there. Most grants though are for nonprofits or publicly owned spaces. So keep that in mind. It's really hard to find grant money for a privately owned residence or building. Um, we do have a grant program, which is um, our Education Trust Fund grant program. We've had this the past couple of years. We never know if we're going to have it, though, from year to year until the legislative session ends, because this is money that's usually appropriated through the Education Trust Fund. Last year, we received um, $1.3 million as an allocation to give out, and we funded grants up to $50,000. I don't think anybody got the mount, a match 
or the um the full amount because we always have so many much in request we had over four million dollars in request from from this grant program um cemeteries can be cleaned or cleaned up you can do rehabilitation roof repair ada compliance um, educational programming so those are just some of the things that can kind of um, you can apply for so um, capital improvement um, repairs like i said the ada compliance so putting in a ramp or a, a wheelchair accessible bathroom coming up with educational programming or tours for your historic site or an exhibit um, there's, um, oh, like I said, the cemetery rehab, we've done uh, cemetery fences, we've done headstone repair, we've done cemetery cleanup. So you can kind of um, get in mind what project you're, you're trying to work for and it might qualify for the education trust fund. Like I said, we usually don't know until the legislative session ends. So applications then are usually due from May until August, you usually have about a month and a half to submit that application. Um, anybody is welcome to apply, like I said, as long as you're a nonprofit organization or a publicly owned space. Um, and more information can be found on our website through the grants resource tab. Um, I think you can look back at last year's grant application. They don't really change from year to year. Um, and grant funding is awarded. There are priorities um, and that's listed out there as well. And I'm going to give uh, Brian a copy of these slides that he can have <laughs> since we're having some difficulties with my PowerPoint presentation. Um, but our website is really one of the most helpful places to go. We have um, our preservation uh, programs tab. So you can look at the list of programs I talked about today. Our historic site information is on there. The grant resource information is on there. Information about the Black Heritage Council is on there also about Clotilda because we haven't even talked about Clotilda. Um, so uh, there's a lot of information on our website. So we're going to try running the slideshow this way and you just give me a thumbs up, Brian, if it changes. Okay, so one of the last programs I wanted to talk about and then demonstrate our historic preservation map is the National Register. So people, most everybody's heard of the National Register of Historic Places. They may not be sure what it is, but they probably heard of it. And it's our nation's list of historic places that are kind of deemed worthy and go through this long process that I have up on my screen to getting um, your site listed. But places can be listed for their significance at the local, state, or national uh, level. So it could be a general store at a crossroads community, but they had an impact on the community through their um, commercial um, footprint of their community. It could be listed because of its local significance to the community. In Florence, there's what, nine historic districts in Florence, and I believe 10? Well, I think it's, I think it's closer to, there are 11 locally designated. Ah, um, 11 there locally are, designated. There are 10 on the National Register. Oh, that's right, because um, McThormore, or no, not McThormore, McFarland Heights wasn't listed yeah. when I lived in Florence, so it was nine then. Um, so you have 10 districts, and those are probably all listed for their significance at the local level. So it can be um, just a community important spot to be listed to the National Register. So um, usually how the National Register works is the property owner, a local government, or some kind of grant NPS funds it. So there's really kind of initial contact with our office and with the National Register Coordinator. Um, her name is Lynn Causey and she's wonderful. Um, we then might have you submit what's called a determination of eligibility form. So that gives us the history and photographs of the site. So um, the next step is to then prepare a nomination. That is really hard to do for a um, lay person without preservation training for a national register nomination they rise to the level where it usually requires a professional to prepare those nominations um, with what the park service because all of this is submitted to the national park service who reviews it and approves it and lists it ultimately so usually there are historic preservation consultants who um, you can hire to work on nominations sometimes there's community um, people who work on nominations or community organizations. 
specifically in the Shoals area, the Muscle Shoals National Heritage Area works on a good amount of nominations for that area. Historic preservation commissions can decide that they want to list places and, and work on nominations, but it really does most of the time require somebody with um, the expertise to do it. So once that's done, um, it gets submitted to Lynn who reviews it and works with the consultant or the preparer to make any changes. Um, it then goes, we have to notify officials um, and the owner of properties. So if there's like a historic district where more than one property is being listed, property notification goes out to them, um, either through a letter or through posting um, at a newspaper or public space. We then have a National Register Review Board meeting, which is made up from um, members of the public as well as um, professionals from around the state of Alabama. Um, Carrie Bar Bars Crawford, who is the director of the Muscle Shoals National Heritage Area, is the chair of the National Register Review Board this year. So um, she has been involved for I know since 2012, um, when I was a student at UNA, she and I would come to these meetings twice a year and um, before I even started working here. So um, those are happen twice a year. They meet and discuss the property. There's a presentation given um, about the history and then they can ask any questions. That board then votes and decides if that um, nominations should be put forth to the National Park Service. Once that vote takes place, there's a final technical review in our office, you know, dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, and then we finally submit that to the National Park Service. They have 45 days to then review it or make any comments to send it back. So, and then that process can just keep going until it gets listed or um, declined. Um, so, you know, it can be a long process from start to finish. It could be two to three years, just depending the fastest you could probably do it is around a year, um, just because of the notification, how long it takes to write these documents, um, and, and that sort of thing. The cool thing about the national register is it's strictly honorary. It doesn't put any um, restrictions on what you can and can't do with your private property. That is if you don't have local design review. That's one of the important things. The National Register, the state of Alabama, we don't put any restrictions on what you can do with your private property, but the local level can. Design review and zoning always lie at the local level. So um, if, if your community has design review, that's why it was decided at the local level. If you don't, that's why it's been decided at the local level that they don't want to do design review. So um, it kind of always goes back to the local level, hopefully in the community, and then the community can decide as a whole what they want to regulate or not regulate. So that's really kind of about the National Register. I'm going to show um, the historic preservation map, because this kind of leads into a huge project that we've undertaken in the last five years um, for historic properties across the state of Alabama. In Montgomery, we have thousands and thousands, like hundreds of thousands of paper files in an office that you would have had to come to our office, physically look through all the files to find what you're looking for. Well, through grants from the Bicentennial, um, commission, we were able to hire interns who worked for the past four or five years digitizing that information and then plotting it on our historic preservation map. So now all of these dots that show up actually are a point that is clickable and has information regarding that site under those points. So our, um, our preservation map includes properties on the Alabama Register. We have a layer for historic African-American schools, whether they're listed or not. We have our historical markers mapped, regular Black Heritage Council and cemetery. We have the National Register of Historic Places mapped. We also have preservation easements. We have the state tax credit. We have county surveys. We have the cemetery register and places in peril. And these lists get updated and grow all the time. This map is not stagnant. So 
it's it's always growing and changing and you may click a point and it may not work because it's a growing and changing map but if you run into technical difficulties there is um, our contact information is on the map so um, we've kind of looked at the uh, program layer you can toggle those on and off there's usually a pdf attached to that point that you can open and then download so like you never have to go back if that's information that you want so i'm going to show y'all and do a little demo about um, to show you how it works It does use ArcGIS, but you don't have to download anything to use it. Um, it's also searchable by name or address. Um, and it does take a minute to populate in because it is such a large map. Our survey um, files just for the state of Alabama, we had um, just, just the survey alone over 100,000 like, um, files to scan so and each of these dots is a file that connects so it, it can take it a minute or two to populate in um, over here on the left side you can change your base map um, depending on um, and it's just like google so you can change it to um, imagery and then you can see kind of all of the layers underneath um, and see kind of the street view then you can toggle on um, and off these layers as well. So what I'm going to do is I looked up of a couple ones yesterday. Um, so we're going to look at court view. You probably know it better as Rogers Hall. <laughs> Um, so it's listed individually um, to the National Register of Historic Places, and this is what it looks like when you um, click on a map. So you can see all of the historic districts in Florence. You can see all the individual listings. Those blue dot or those blue stars are Alabama Register. Are we showing up? Brian. We're sh we're showing the the map demo of the state of Alabama. Okay, hold on. Let me do a new share. What about now? There we go. Okay. Perfect. So um, each of these blue dots are like an Alabama register point. These big kind of polygons that you see are historic districts. So right there, there's the Wood Avenue Historic District. Um, you can really see, you know, what all is listed in your area. So that's just Florence. Um, like I said, it's searchable by name. So court view. And then it brought up the point. So to find the PDF, just scroll down to the bottom and then there's going to be attachments. So there's the PDF of the court view nomination. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at this nomination. It was done in 1973. So the National Register wasn't started until 1966. This is a very old nomination. If you read this nomination, it's strictly going to focus on the family, the family's experience, and the family's home. It's not going to address anyone else who lived in the home, anyone else who worked at the home. It's strictly going to focus on the white plantation owner of this home. So you're going to see it's only five pages. That wouldn't fly these days. Um, five pages is strictly going to probably talk about the architecture um, of the house. And then um, the photo that would have been submitted with it is only going to be one. That's it. In 1970s, the National Register required five pages, one photograph. So let's go look at a newer one. So we're going to look at Fame Recording Studios. I'm a little biased for this one because I worked on it. Um, and I was looking at it yesterday 
and I found a typo in it. <laughs> I was like, of course. Um, oh, oh, that's the Alabama Register nomination. So you'll see sometimes there's two dots on an area. Like on this one, you'll see there's the blue star. That means it was listed first to the Alabama Register. And then this green dot is going to be the National Register um, listing for it. So you could have multiple dots on one property. There's some, we have an Alabama res Register list dot, a National Register dot, a historical marker, and maybe a cemetery. Because sites have different, you know, not every site's the same. And you might have been first listed to the Alabama Register. So we have a nomination for that and then eventually listed to the Na National Register. So we have a nomination for that. So all the information regarding that site, like if we had a historic survey on Fane, it would be on there as well. So like all of that, you should be able to see under one. Um, I don't know why Adobe's being weird for me today. So here's the Fane um, National Register nomination. You're going to notice up at the top, it says 106 pages. <laughs> and then um, the photographs I looked at yesterday, there's like 50. So the National Register changes and grows and moves. It's not some stagnant program. Things change. Program requirements change. The things we look at change. Specifically in fame, we focused a lot on the Muscle Shoals sound and the experiences of African-American musicians who came to the Shoals during this time. Of course, fame was still kicking and, and going in the 70s, so this wouldn't be listed then. But we, we, we learn and we grow as preservation professionals. Things change. The way we look at sites change. The way we look at communities change. The way that your community feels today is probably not the way it's going to feel and be in the way things feel important now are not going to be the things that are important 50 years from now. So the preservation field kind of has to be a little more fluid. Um, and the way that we kind of feel as a nation kind of is reflected in our preservation movements. So now in the past 20 years, you've seen, it, seen a huge increase of documentation of African-American heritage sites, specifically documenting, documenting civil rights heritage sites. So you see as, as the national mindset change, hopefully it's reflected in National Register nominations. That's not always the case. And we're working to go back and hopefully be more inclusive in some of these nominations. Like if you look at the Alabama State Capitol, it's a national historic landmark. It's a national historic landmark for what happened there in 1861 when Thomas, Je or Thomas Jefferson, when Jefferson Davis took the Confederate oath of office, not for Martin Luther King standing on its steps and giving a speech. That's what's written in the nomination. But we as a collective nation know that that's what, not what makes the Alabama State Capitol so important, but it's not yet reflected in its documentation. So that's kind of how preservation can grow and be fluid. Um, it kind of changes to what the community wishes want. Uh, most of our programs go back to the community. We can't do what we do without community input, without community involvement, without the community doing Alabama register nominations, cemetery register nominations, we don't exist without you, the constituent. So preservation isn't a stagnant field. It's not placing a bell jar or a glass under a, a, a building under a, a glass cloche. It's, it's breathing, changing. It's, you know, um, it's, it's changing. Um, I think it changes all the time. It's changed in the seven years I've been working as a professional, particular during COVID. Um, that was one thing I thought we could talk about just a little bit about what's changed specifically for me and my job here as the ta state tax incentives. Cost of goods and labor are increasing about 30%, particularly when it comes to materials required for a historic rehab. So you know, it can be very much labor intensive to um, to rehab old windows. 
Um, so you've got to think about that when you're, you're thinking about preservation is those kind of changes post COVID. Also climate change. Um, we're seeing a lot now um, of flood awareness and things like that for the park service. Um, there's been some articles recently about um, one ran in the Atlantic, uh, how we should stop fetish uh, fetishizing old houses um, and how we should always build new and new is better. Well, from an economic standpoint, preservation is better. Um, the economics of preservation, um, there's a whole book out there by Donovan Rickema, so I'm not going to um, preach it here, but there, there have been studies and it's proven that um, there's less carbon emissions, we're putting less into landfills when we're doing historic preservation, we're, when we're rehabbing old buildings, it helps us in the long run. And then, so one of the last things that I've been kind of preaching about in the last five minutes is where do you want preservation to go? Because you're the ones who go out and do, you're the ones who gather, you're the ones who are in the community with your feet on the ground, knowing what's going on. So what's important to your community and where do you want preservation to go in the future? So, because that's what we rely on. We rely on you and people like Brian who um, facilitate this kind of discussion and bring awareness to our programs. So without out people, without the community, we can't exist. So um, I'm gonna just leave my uh, number, name and number up here. So, you know, and this will be in the slides. Like I said, our website's very handy. All of my information is on there. Um, every program I talked about today, there's way more information on there about those programs. So, uh, Brian, do you have any questions you want to discuss today? Well, first of all, thank you. This is incredibly informative, and there's so much information on here. And um, I hope everyone will take the, the time to go on the Alabama Historical Commission website and check out some of the different things they have to offer, especially the map. Uh, I can't say enough about this. I think it's, it's just an incredible tool. It's got so much information. Um, there's just, just a tremendous amount of work went into creating this, um, which is, is uh, so happy to see that this is happening and, and that it's going to be continuously updated. Like you said, I mean, that's huge. Yeah, um, so right now to, we only have 55 counties plotted out of the 67. So it's still growing and changing. So if you're looking in your community and we don't have anything there yet, just hang on. We're working cool. on it. <laughs> cool. Um, to the questions I had, I just just a few, and, and uh, because you really did an excellent job of covering just about everything in here, um, and, and I know you said this, I just want to kind of reiterate this point because this is something we run into all the time. The National Register is honorary. Honorary. The regulation comes in at the local level. That's so correct. Could, could you talk a little bit about? what can be regulated sure. locally? So um, we have CLGs, um, some of them, all of them have historic preservation commissions. Some of an outreach branch or a, one of the jobs of a historic preservation commission can be guidelines or design review and placing regulations. It's usually on paint color, fences, maybe roofs, like if, if you, whatever kind of shingle they might require or something like that, window replacement usually. It's nothing major, no interior review. You can do whatever you want to the interior of your home. A lot of places don't require design review for the rear of your home. Sometimes it's just on your facade, your front street facing portion that they have design review. Each area can be, or each town can be different. You can, um, you can really, it's, it's up to you um, in your community. You can do, so say your community had um, a lot of Queen Anne um, architecture. So the spindles and the Victorian looking houses. So you may want to say, okay, well, we're not going to allow um, anything over two stories because then, okay, well, it doesn't fit in within the character of your house or the neighborhood. So you can do things like that. You can make it, uh, you can do some kind of uh, design review on your lot size, on the setback of how far a house needs to be set back or close to the street. It can really be as stringent or as loose as you want. 
most of the people when they think of historic districts I always hear uh, his uh, or historical um, kind of that people say hysterical uh, societies or that not everywhere is Savannah Georgia um, you know um, not everywhere is um, New Orleans or someplace that's a big city. So it really is dependent upon what's important to the community who's having design review implemented. It can be on just a certain amount of like streets. So uh, take McF uh, McFarland Heights, for example, where the Frank Lloyd Wright house is. Um, you could just do that neighborhood and you could say, these are the character defining features of the neighborhood. So, um, the fenestration on certain housing styles, that sort of thing. Or you can say, hey, we're just going to de decide, you know, okay, well, if you have brick, you can't paint your brick house. You know, it can be kind of what you want it and need it to be. It's usually done through um, public comment and planning with community members. It can be done usually before you have design guideline review done, you have a historic survey done. So through that historic survey, you can go in and see, okay, well, this neighborhood has a lot of bungalows with wide porches. We're not going to allow infill on those porches. We're not going to allow those porches to be enclosed. So, you know, those are just a few of the kind of examples. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It could be, okay, we're not going to allow bright pink and purple house colors. Um, you don't have to pick a palette. You can just say, okay, we're not going to allow these things, but you know, it, it's really dependent. And then working with your planning office is also always helpful to planning and zoning. You can do things through planning and zoning um, for setbacks and things like that. If you didn't want to have design review, you could place some kind of zoning for residential, um, new residential structures being brought in or infilled in a historic district. Huntsville does something similar to that. Thank you. That was a, an excellent explanation of that. I wanted to kind of clear that up because that's one of the kind of things that we see a lot. Yes, we, we get those calls a lot. And then insurance calls, like people think it costs more to insurance a historic, insure a historic home. And it doesn't because since the National Register doesn't place any restrictions on your home, if it burns down, you don't have to build it back the same. So a lot of insurance people think, oh, well, you know, your, your premium is going to go up because you live in a historic district. It shouldn't. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. This has been excellent. If people have other questions, can they, is they email oh, yeah. you? Email me, call me. Um, both my name and number are on, uh, on the screen now, um, or you can reach out to me on, uh, through uh, the website as well, like my contact information's on there. I'm pretty much here all the time. <laughs> excellent. Thank you so much, Hannah. This yeah, has been thanks, an Brian. excellent, excellent presentation. I'm sorry we had issues with the PowerPoint, but like I said, I will share that and you can have that. <laughs> no worries. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.